when I give you uh, the title of this talk, you said, uh, what, uh, what a stupid question. <laughs> so uh, people must know that. And uh, so is geomorphology uh, really an issue in river restoration? Um, If this person was here, he would say, what a crazy question. And then, uh, yeah, it's a question which is a bit provocative. And uh, if I had uh, Jeff in front of me, it would be the beginning. So I would be a bit impressed. And uh, it would be a beginning to a, a scientific discussion, uh, passionate. And I remember uh, when I was uh, uh, younger. Uh, this uh, book uh, had been uh, edited by uh, Jeff and uh, the group in Lyon, Cl Claude Amoros, uh, and the, the boys of Jeff, uh, uh, which are, some of them are in the room. So I learned a lot from this, uh, from this book and from this uh, very uh, inspiring uh, geomorphologist. And then uh, in 1993, so Thomas uh, was a, a master student, uh, uh, we discussing, uh, we met in Lyon at that time, so 1993 is not so far, finally, uh, a paper uh, in uh, my first peer review paper in, uh, at that time, Regulated Rivers Research and Management. And Jeff uh, had been very supportive and helpful. And since that, uh, I had many exchange with him, and uh, um, he missed me a lot. So thank you, Jeff, and I hope that the discussion here may uh, be interesting also for him. Okay, so uh, is geomorphology uh, really interesting for restoration? Uh, Stefan Schmutz, uh, who introduced me, uh, did a lot on river restoration. And when you are asking for the success of river restoration, most of the time it's related to uh, ecological indicators. And uh, you have a nice publication here. A lot have been done on the Danube and other rivers in uh, uh, Austria. And you see the number of species before, after, light built to see how things is evolving after restoration. If you go on the Rhone, so the, uh, the landscape is a, bit, uh, is a bit similar. We have a, a large river. We have dam, 22 dams. We have structures like this, 16 along the Rhone River between Geneva and, uh, uh, and the Mediterranean Sea. So you see that you have a big canal, a large part of the water is going into that to produce electricity, and the poor old Rhone is along this channel. So there is many stacks uh, an issue in terms of restoration. And, um, <clears throat> If I take this example, but we have many others, and the, the nice work of Jean-Michel Olivier, you see that to estimate the success of restoration, uh, we are looking at the recolonization with fast-flowing species. You have a pre and you have a past, and on this uh, bypass section, you see that it's very significant. So uh, what should we speak about uh, geomorphology? Uh, in parallel, we have uh, ecological works, but we have also uh, geomorphological works. And uh, uh, in this domain of uh, river restoration, uh, we have restored some former channel. So most of the time, uh, you can see in the forest a very uh, remnant channel, so dry, a, a very nice riparian forest, and some of them have been dredged to recreate a uh, uh, water pound, more or less connected uh, with, uh, with uh, the main channel. And it's inspired by all the work done by Claude Amoros and his group about uh, uh, connectivity. So in this domain, um, we have done a lot uh, to sample the different restored uh, former channels to characterize uh, grain size conditions, but also uh, hydraulic condition and uh, uh, hydrological connectivity. And then we can order the different restored former channel according to grain size conditions with uh, different indicators. 
And so these ones are connected from upstream and downstream, and when you go back, when you go to here, you can get the, the back waters. So uh, it's a way, a strategy, to see uh, the diversity of uh, the aquatic habitat in terms of functioning. It's less expensive than uh, uh, studying macroinvertebrate community. So uh, it's also a way, so you, you can gain money if you go to uh, geomorphology for a restoration assessment. It's again provocative, just to wake you up. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but it's a way also to link uh, geomorphic uh, characters uh, with ecological characters to see how it works. And um, it's possible also to, to, uh, uh, to predict uh, uh, the characteristics of each of them according to the frequency of the overflow upstream and also uh, the, the sheer stress we, has, we have within the channel. So this is interesting because you can manipulate the geometry of the plug before acting. And uh, looking at the different uh, river uh, uh, channel characters you have within the reach, if you have a lot of uh, system like this one, you may like to have this one or some uh, sandy ones. So in this domain, you can uh, uh, design your, your plug to have a type you don't have uh, on your reach. And you can maximize the diversity of conditions you have on a site. And uh, it works quite well also with the Castella Connectivity Index, uh, as you can see here. And Emmanuel is calculating his index once the work is done. He's using his environmental variable collected in the field to do that. So we can uh, pre-calculate the Castella's uh, Connectivity Index before acting. Also, and this is one uh, big piece, I think, in restoration, is uh, um, so we have, we expect an ecological improvement, but also we expect the work we did, the investment we did, can last for a certain period of time. So the question of sustainability of the habitat we created is a critical issue. And on the own, this is the main question we had to answer. Could we expect the restoration we did are sustainable? And uh, here you have a, a piece of work done uh, by uh, uh, Jérémy Riquier and, and the group uh, on you know, the, the average fine sedimentation thickness, how fast uh, the uh, former channel are alleviated. And what we have seen is a part of them uh, when we look at the trend, are time dependent. So they are evolving their, uh, to a full terrestrialization. But this is quite slow. So when we discuss with practitioners, they said, ah, yeah, five decades, six decades, seven decades, it's, it's good. For us, it's sustainable. So it's open a debate, uh, what do we call sustainability? What is the time scale we have in mind? Which is an interesting topic and still open. Uh, we, we can see also when we have a decadal floods that we have scouring processes. But the scouring processes does not uh, modify the trajectory of the system. So they are truly time dependent. But you see that there is some, some others here which are not time dependent. So this one can last for a quite long time. So this is a, a delivery, the sustainability issue, which is important and which can be provided by, by geomorphology. So I don't know if you know these uh, photos. Uh, a lot of discussion, I think, in the United States about this. It has been provided uh, by Matt Condolf. Uh, you see uh, a tiny meandering rivers, uh, uh, nice-looking rivers, uh, nice landscapes. Uh, and after a flood, uh, it goes this way. Okay, so it means here there is a problem. You design a new ecosystem which is not adapted to the geographical context. You can't create this. You may have a dream, and uh, uh, Matt is developing this issue. Uh, we like uh, sinuous rivers, usually with a riparian forest uh, on, this, uh, on its banks. 
So this is the nice rivers we, we may have in mind collectively. But this cannot be done, created everywhere. So we have to take into account the geographical context and what it is possible in one site, what it is possible in another site to improve ecological conditions of rivers. So, uh, the key questions we have in mind uh, in the uh, geomorphology domain are related to restoration, and we can speak about this uh, uh, with, uh, with colleagues for a long time. Should we promote active or passive restoration? And there is a bunch of solutions in the two domains. So, uh, you can't apply everything on one side. You have to choose. And this is a critical point to see what kind of measures can be adapted to one side. So if we translate this in a geomorphological term, is can we play? Geomorphology is a pleasure. Can we play? Perhaps. With forms, habitats. This is exactly what we did when we dredged form a channel along the Rhone River or along the Danube as well, or with processes. And we can help the river to self-restore, you know? One is possible somewhere, another one is possible elsewhere. So, um, with this book, uh, a long time ago with Matt and all the colleagues, uh, we try to summarize the tools we can use in the practical domains. And uh, 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 the, the last chapter is uh, about the integration of these tools. So what it is critical for restoration uh, in geomorphology is the diagnosis. I mean, if we play with the form or with the processes, we, know, we must know how the river works. So actually, in the present time, in terms of process, acting processes, but how do we reach this step? And uh, so the trajectory, the historical trajectory, is also very important to understand notably how the river may react to an action uh, we can uh, 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 propose. And also at the project design level, we, we may have some uh, uh, studies before acting, we, we had some example, but also some monitoring because uh, restoration is, uh, is quite new and we don't know really how the river can react. So we have to uh, monitor and learn from our success and from our errors. And uh, so I have to, uh, I must have a special course about the use of this equipment. Uh, so this is a bottom-up strategy from at the rich scale, but uh, it seems to me uh, that uh, another scale is very important, and uh, this, this uh, uh, box has been opened by ecologists, and uh, my friend Didier Pont is, uh, is uh, in the room, and uh, he, gave me the, he transmitted the virus. Uh, we have to work uh, at the regional scale with the top-down uh, uh, strategies. We have to learn uh, the different things at the regional scale, uh, to, to do uh, the, the diagnose, what is the status of the, of the river systems, but also use this information for prioritizing actions. Uh, because at a local scale, we are blind, so we have to de-zoom to have uh, an overview and see where we have to, uh, where we have to, where we have to act. So in terms of diagnose, just a, a few examples. Uh, here you have a thermal imagery, it's a braided river, it's not the Tagliamento, but it's uh, close to that, and you see that you have different kind of blue color, it means you have different kind of uh, coal patches and refuges. And what we have learned from this kind of studies is uh, when you are comparing a bunch of braided rivers, you can see that some of them are characterized by a range of uh, thermal uh, diversity, you have different kind of uh, uh, thermal patches, and it's related to some uh, uh, different kind of channels you have in the braided uh, systems. But you can see that some of them are characterized truly uh, by this kind of functionings. But uh, some others are not. 
you have just uh, sometimes a, a, a tiny, you know, main channel, and you don't have really a braided system. And so this is uh, partly related to the geomorphic functioning of the system and how it is well supplied in sediment, how it is well connected to the groundwater. And so one of the questions which was asked by the water agency in charge of the implementation of the water framework directive is, can we have some uh, braided rivers which are in a good ecological status and uh, others not? And this was a big question. And uh, partly it's related to this kind of functioning. This kind of functioning can be uh, uh, impacted uh, by water pumping, for example, and the disconnection of the groundwater with the, the, the superficial water. Uh, another example, which is also interesting, is on the Dordogne River. So the Dordogne River, southwest France, good food. Uh, it's a, a nice, um, good for tourism, canoeing and so on. So uh, it's a, a nice uh, river, and a lot is done on this river since a long time in terms of restoration. But they never did a diagnosis, an initial diagnosis. And uh, one time they stopped and they said, okay, what we are doing, is it meaningful? Is it appropriate? I mean, they are removing bank protection, for example, but they don't know uh, what is, uh, what is it meaningful to have uh, an introduction of this amount of gravel compared to uh, what the river would need. And uh, another problem is, uh, um, there is some potential responsibility and fighting among stakeholders. Is the problem related to the dam? Is the problem related to gravel mining? And so this is, uh, can be estimated with a diagnosis, a geomorphic diagnosis, at the beginning of the story. So we did that 20 years after the story began. And the story could continue because we did not add uh, uh, we did not have such information. So uh, this is a, a PhD of Fabien. Uh, it's a very classic uh, geomorphological studies in a way, but it's very useful in terms of uh, practice. So we are going to explore the dam reservoir effects when they were built, what is their effects on the uh, peak flows, what are their effects on uh, bed load transport, and also combine this with the mining activity and try to separate uh, different uh, periods to try to separate what are the causal drivers. We use historical information, but we use also field information, and notably the, the grain size, so you can get uh, over the longitudinal uh, distance, uh, the, the grain size characteristics, and uh, more and more we are looking at the armor ratio, so the grain size of the surface, the grain size of the subsurface, uh, to see if there is an armoring, some evidence of sediment starvation. Where are they located related to mining? Where are they located related to dams? And we combine this historical information with uh, uh, process-based understanding and sediment transport. So we, use, uh, we, we, we can use uh, uh, hydraulic formula to, to calculate uh, the transport capacity, but usually we combine this also with field measures. So this is a slide for my uh, colleagues in geomorphology who are passionate by sediment transport. And uh, so we have a new techniques we use Martin, I just introduce you to this. Uh, so we use uh, uh, active RFID. Uh, there is a, a system where they are not in collision each other. So when you come with the antenna, you can sense all the gravels. Yeah, you, you must like gravel when, when you are doing geomorphology. And uh, so they are equipped on column like this. So if you do a cross sections, you come up after a flood and you can see if the particles are still here with your canoe, it's a lazy geomorphology now with a new technology, and uh, uh, you can determine the scour layer. And with a passive transponder, you can see also where the particle uh, went, and you can calculate what is 
uh, uh, the bed load transport for an event. If you have several events, you can have a good understanding how uh, the conveyor belt is, is behaving on these rivers, and it gives you a very important uh, results for the sediment budget you have to uh, estimate. So we are more and more lazy, and now we put the antenna on, on the drone. So uh, it's still an information for my colleagues in geomorphology. Okay, uh, so if we are before uh, acting, one of the questions, if you play with processes, uh, you may have uh, troubles. And here is an example of study we did with our colleague uh, in Germany uh, to uh, work on the redynamization of the Rhine River. Uh, and uh, before doing anything, we had to estimate what kind of risk we can get uh, related to the actions which are planned. And so uh, there is, a, you see, it's a bypass sections like on the Rhone and some Danube examples. It was a, 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 a truly braided system in uh, uh, 1828. So we try to, to improve the condition and notably to uh, reactivate a little bit uh, the sediment transport uh, along, this, uh, along this ridge. And if you uh, uh, reactivate sediment transport uh, and associated habitat, you need sediments. You can mechanically introduce them, it's not so fun. But you have also to consider if it's a sustainable solution. And there is some other solution. Our colleague of uh, electric uh, company, EDF, was developing about a controlled bank erosion, so a sort of self-restoration to introduce sediment into the river. And uh, so there is a, a, a set of risks. I mean, uh, the local people, the stakeholders, usually they have a long list of potential problems, so we had to go in each of them to estimate if they are really true or if we can consider it's not so important. And so most of the studies was done on that. So uh, Andreas Dietrich in Germany worked on the, uh, on the uh, sedimentary introduction and its potential effects on the armor layer and the possible destabilization of the armor layer. Uh, colleagues in EDF worked on the control bank erosion uh, to see uh, if we can have structure allowing to promote erosion, but also uh, over uh, a lateral distance, which is acceptable. And uh, this was related to uh, numerical modeling. Uh, some of the problems uh, cannot be is assessed, evaluated uh, in flume experiment or numerically, and we did also uh, in the field some uh, experiments. So here you have a, a deposit, uh, which is roughly 20,000 cubic meters of sediment. It's a, it's a German gravel, which has been provided uh, from this area where we are lowering the floodplain. Also, it's another restoration measures. And this has been monitored uh, for a certain period of time to see the diffusion of the gravel uh, within, within the channel. And uh, we, we combined, we compared, you know, the, the pattern of the... The, the, the bathymetric change, the movement of the sediment waves related to the tracers to see what's going on. And so we saw that uh, how fast the, the, the gravel is going downstream, and we were able to prove that uh, for the navigation purposes, the bed load transport would not be truly a problem, uh, at least for several decades. And also, we understood that the gravel augmentation was not truly a, a measure which could uh, allow to a real habitat improvement. And this was connected with works done at, uh, in ecology, and Sibyl did her PhD uh, on this, and uh, you will have time to, to discuss with them about the ecological aspects. So uh, another way about uh, the monitoring, which is also interesting, again, in terms of gravel augmentation. This is a Drac River uh, in southeast of France. You see a, a very nice braided rivers. When you see the thermal imagery, you can see you have many 
uh, 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 patches of cold water. It's a, a nice braided river, very well connected to the groundwater, uh, a potentially hot spot of biodiversity. Um, one ridge has been recently restored with gravel augmentation. We completely recreated a, a, a braided river, 450,000 cubic meters of gravel, a big, big work. 26 hectares of forest which has been cleared. So we fly over uh, one year after, two years after it, it has been restored, and, and you see the channel, you can compare them, you see that the, the channels are wider, and then you, you have no cold patches. So actually, we are in between, uh, uh, perhaps having some interesting ecological patches. But we are not yet here. The river is, geomorphologically speaking, not yet adapted to the works which were be done. So it was a bit disappointing for the practitioners, but uh, we need a certain time uh, for the river to adjust and uh, uh, create the habitat we are expecting uh, from, uh, from it. So this is the way we are producing the information and you have the two sides. This one where you see that over the ridge it, 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 the temperature is progressively decreasing, feeded by groundwater, and the ridge I showed you is this one. You see an increase uh, in temperature because the uh, water area uh, offered to, uh, to the uh, solar radius is quite large compared to the, uh, the other sites, and you have no groundwater uh, input. Okay, so uh, let's go to another issue. Um, this is a work of uh, uh, Bertrand Morandi done with uh, the group of... Uh, uh, Christian Walter, Roram Kell. So we compare restoration sites in Germany and uh, in France. So you see that Germany did quite well compared to France. It's the first uh, uh, results you, you can see on these figures. But what it was also interesting is uh, in France, uh, we did differently than in Germany. Uh, two countries, neighbor, uh, they have some geographical conditions which are sometimes different, but uh, in large part, you, you, you have the same landscapes. And uh, you see that the solutions can be different. You see, if you take France, uh, initiate a, a channel dynamics, it's much more developed than in Germany. If you take this example, recruitment or placement of large wood, you see the Germans, they like wood. French, they don't like wood. Okay, so uh, it means uh, uh, it's not uh, scientifically, un only scientifically driven. You have many social factors uh, which are entering into the equation and explaining why we are doing such measure here and why we are doing another measure elsewhere. And this is a big question for us in terms of actions. Uh, there is many, many kind of aspects, and here, uh, Courtenay introduced the social science aspects. We need here social scientists to help us to understand what's going on. So uh, we have a question for geomorphology, but we, we have also a question for social science and all the disciplines which can be involved in the restoration process. Okay, so restoration at a local scale is often opportunist. You act where, where people are ready to act. Uh, but you, you may not act where uh, there is an urgency where you must act in priority. So there is two questions there. Where, what should we do, related to what I introduced before, and a related question is where should we act first? And so we begin, you, you remember the virus and the, the problem I had with Didier Pont, so uh, we begin to work at a regional scale and trying to create some geomorphic indicators like the sinuosity rate, uh, combine the sinuosity rate uh, with the width of the valley floor. You know, in geomorphology, if you have a narrow 
uh, a valley, your river has not really a large room to move, but if the river, the valley is wide, then there is some place where uh, a geomorphic process can act. So this has been done for a while. We try to use also aerial photos to, to have an idea of the observation of erosion through time. And we, we went uh, to uh, uh, a simple model like this one, where we can predict uh, the potential uh, bank erosion. And this is uh, uh, predicted and observed. And the two main variables we have in our GIS uh, system is the stream power based on the uh, hydrological information we, we collected from gauging station uh, and related also uh, to information we, like the slope we had within the, the GIS. And the W star, which is a proxy of the potential sediment supply. So if it's high, it's a, a, a very active sediment supply. When it's low, you have a, almost a not significantly a coarse sediment uh, uh, which is transported within the channel. So using these two parameters, it's, uh, it's possible uh, to have a map like this where you have a potential uh, uh, a channel movement, and you see that here, uh, we are in a lowland area, it does not move too much, but there is some place, some reaches where you can see movement. And the rest of these catchments, this is a Rhone catchment, uh, you, you have quite uh, active shifting river. And so this indicator uh, is an indicator, potentially, of the responsiveness of the river. And uh, with this map, uh, roughly, you can see where you can may act on forms and where you should act on processes. Okay, and we, we did uh, similar things uh, with uh, uh, colleagues uh, in Italy, but at the diagnosis level, uh, it's in the Piedmont. We, we have uh, exceptional data, which is, uh, so we have near-infrared imagery, but we have a LiDAR, a regional LiDAR, and it's not available everywhere. So with this information, we, we can do much better in, in terms of... Uh, in term of uh, uh, geomorphology, uh, geomorphological characteristics. And so we, we move to a, 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 a graph like this, uh, where you have uh, the size, uh, the catchment size, and here you, you have the depth. And you see that you have uh, uh, many, many reaches, uh, which are located between 5 meters and 10 meters. So you, you, you see when you have a catchment uh, where the catchment area is 100 kilometers square, a, 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 a bank of six meters high is quite unusual. And so uh, we use uh, the data of Frédéric Gob, uh, an exceptional uh, data set on the uh, Western uh, French Alps, uh, where he, he got this kind of relationship uh, within rivers which has not been too much affected by human pressures over the last century. And we, we got from him this, uh, uh, this uh, law here. So it's possible to see what is the distance between uh, 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 this uh, uh, law and the different reaches. So you see that some of them are located on, on it. So it means they are, they are not really affected by a significant change vertically. They are not incised. But you can see also that uh, most of the other rivers are affected. So at the regional scale, in the Piedmont catchment, uh, in the Piedmont region, a lot of rivers has been affected by sediment starvation and channel incision. So if you have just use a, a regression law and middle conditions, you may not have seen that. But uh, it's a problem at the regional scale. So, um, and we can do a, a map of that. So, another issue which has been also discussed on uh, one of the workshops yesterday is uh, some uh, theoretical discussion. We, we, can, we can't do any progress if we sometimes we stop a little bit, we read, and we try to theorize uh, a little bit. And in the river restoration domain, it's, uh, it's truly it was truly, it's still truly a, a critical issue. 
And so here we, um, okay. uh, so here we, we introduce the trajectory concept. Is the river we have, uh, we will have tomorrow can't be the river we had in the past. Many things changed. And so we have to manage what we could call today Anthropocene rivers with their own properties. You can learn from the past, but the past can be a target. You can't go to the past because there is many, in the history of the rivers, many things occurred, and then it's impossible with a, a small, tiny measures to uh, hope to go to the past. And so uh, we discussed the term recovery, and uh, we said uh, rather than to look at the past, look at the future and define your own objectives. And so the discussion continues uh, with the resilience. Uh, uh, two years ago, we had a, a seminar in, uh, in the United States to speak about resilience in geomorphology. So we, we go back to the definition of ecologist. Uh, we, we feed our debate uh, from the ecological theory. And uh, we have seen that there is, uh, 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 in the definition given by Olling, 73 ability of these systems to absorb changes of stable variables, driving variables and parameters, and still persist. And this opened a really critical questioning about the link between the uh, ecological theory and the geomorphological theory. And we have seen that the theory is roughly the same and is evolving in parallel. And uh, so we reintroduce, for example, if I go back to these figures, the ball, the famous ball of the resilience. They are here. You don't see them, but they are here. It's another way of representing the problem. Uh, here you have uh, the resilience to a pulse disturbance. Okay, you have a flood, your river is reacting, and then it goes back to its uh, uh, previous stat, state. So how long time we need to go back to this state? This is not the resilience of Oling here, but it's the resilience of many ecologists. It's another school of the school of Oling. And here you have the resilience to a press disturbance, to a change. You know, the state before the change is different from the state we have after. So we don't speak about the same resilience. And if we go back to the braided river and the work of Clement, the work of uh, uh, Florian Mallard on the, on, on the Val Roseg, for example, they work on this resilience, the resilience uh, to a, a, a pulse disturbance. A braided river is really resilient from, from this uh, point of view because they have many patches, there is a strong connectivity and uh, it can readjust very quickly after a flood. But the braided river is not at all resilient to a change, to a press disturbance. If you change a little bit the sediment supply regime, its pattern will change very quickly. So take care about the world of resilience. There is many issues behind them. A lot of things had to be studied in the different uh, uh, school of thought. But it's a, an, is, an interesting topic where we can share a theoretical aspect amongst the two communities. And it's also interesting uh, to see how the theory is progressively combined or not combined uh, through time. So we are reinventing uh, the will in a way. Okay, so if we go back to this, uh, here you have uh, the work of Depré. It's a, a nice example where you have the age of the former channels, the percentage of initial surface reduction. These are the behavior of former channels when they have been cut off in natural conditions. So you see that the terrestrialization is very quick. The system is working very actively. And these are the ones which evolved after the human regulation at the beginning of the 20th century. So this gives you in mind 
the, uh, the pound, the unit we are restoring, behaved completely differently than the one we had in the past. So the system we work, the social ecological system we work on, is a new system. And we have to consider it's functioning now and not the one he had in the past. So we work quite a lot on a, a conceptual uh, uh, definition of restoration, and it's an emerging uh, topic uh, uh, with uh, Bertrand Morandi. We work on uh, almost 400 publications within which we, we found some definition of river restoration. So meta-analysis is also a, an issue we, we, we must have in mind, which is common in ecology as well. But just to show you this, uh, the reference we have in mind to target actions, uh, we discuss about the temporal references, the past as a target, and you see the temporal references from 1994 to 2017, it goes down in the definition. It progressively uh, is progressively reduced. And if you take into account the social economical uh, uh, elements of the definition, ecosystem services, for example, and uh, you see that in, is more and more uh, common in the definitions. So we are doing restoration, we repair river to improve ecological condition, but to satisfy uh, also uh, uh, society, humans, uh, uh, living within this area. So there is a, a new evolution, progressive evolution, related to our discussion about what should be restoration. Okay, so um, geomorphologists, uh, uh, it is a pretty nice period because uh, practitioners are interested. It's a critical issue. Uh, we have to introduce geomorphology uh, in our thinking to do restoration better, and notably, mainly, when processes are actively uh, acting. So, and one of the issues is now in the brain of practitioners and in the brain of some, also, of the scientists uh, to act on a river, we have to widen uh, uh, the space and time to act. It's not a only a local problem, so we have to reintegrate it in space and time. So, if you look at bank erosion, uh, 20 years ago, we were doing a reprap. You have a problem of bank erosion? Reprap. Now, we try to think a little bit, not too much, but a little bit. And uh, we try to see what's, what, the, what is the problem. Okay, and according to what is the problem, a good diagnosis, we may have a, a set of potential solutions. Reprap is one, but uh, you can leave room for river. Tom, it's a nice concept, uh, the room for river. And an erodible corridor, uh, uh, in some of uh, other areas. So there is uh, some issue in terms of uh, uh, knowledge uh, production. But what I have learned is uh, uh, in France or in, uh, in UK, we, we are quite comfortable, we have a lot of geomorphologists. But I know in some other countries, uh, there is almost none. So there is some constraints, uh, some academic issues uh, to, to have some geomorphologists. If you don't have geomorphologists, you, you have a lack of knowledge. If you have, don't have social scientists in your group, you have also a lack of knowledge to answer to complex problems. And so, uh, according to me, the academic world must move a little bit. There is some, uh, some uh, uh, slow processes. And uh, to get a geomorphologist, sometimes in, in, in department, there is some tension. It's used less in geography to have a fluvial geomorphologist. But in reverent science, it can be an issue. So uh, one, one of the, uh, the issues is to develop a, a collaborative uh, uh, research. And uh, it's a collective adventure. I introduced geomorphology, but if you have only geomorphology, I mean, it's boring, it's used less. You have to combine geomorphology with, with social science, with ecology, and you have to build such a group. And Courtney, on Monday, she has uh, spoken about observatory. Uh, so we have to observe over the long term in the different, uh, with the different issue to try to understand at least a little bit uh, how environment functions. It's a complex system. So I, I would like to thank all my colleagues here. A lot of uh, people are also involved over the last 20 years in geomorphology. Uh, I hope all are 
here, and now we are uh, fully involved in a new adventure, which is a school of integrated watershed science. So a real integration of all the disciplines to really create a, a riverine science institute. It's a question of uh, interdisciplinarity. It's also a question of transdisciplinarity, because you, you can't do that without any linkages with practitioners. So we try to involve quite a lot the practitioners in the domain. And to do that, we have also to connect research and education. And so uh, we try to uh, uh, put the virus of interdisciplinarity uh, within the student body at an undergraduate student, at an undergraduate level. The idea is uh, you must be good in your discipline, but you must be open-minded to the others, because you will work uh, in practice or in the academic domain with the other disciplines. So, uh, Thomas uh, and his group, uh, um, I did not thank them at the beginning of the talk. I wanted to do it, and I do it now. Thank you very much for your confidence and your invitation. Uh, they asked to join this conference with the Integrated Science for River. It's another conference every three years. The atmosphere is the same than the one we have here a very positive attitude, very exciting discussion in an interdisciplinary domain. Uh, it will occur, you know, the control of the technology. In June uh, 2021, the atmosphere is good, notably after the, after the conference dinner. Um, so, uh, a very good group. I'm very good, uh, I'm very comfortable in this conference and in Vienna. So I thank you very much for your attention.